Hey everyone, I have 1030, so I'm going to say good morning. Uh, my name is Ashley Edwards and I'll be hosting for y'all today on our Beef Brunch Educational Series. Um, we're excited to welcome Dr. David Lawman with us today. Um, Dr. Lawman is a professor at Oklahoma State um, and serves also as the Beef Cattle Extension Specialist for Oklahoma State University. Um, Dr. Lawman holds the Harrington Endowed Chair with Split Extension and Research Appointment. He works primarily in the beef cattle industry focused on cow-calf and stalker cattle production. His extension and applied research program includes beef cattle nutrition and management with emphasis on beef cattle grazing and genetic by environment interactions in beef production systems. His program goals are to provide producers with information and decision tools to facilitate production system profitability, improve cow herd efficiency, and improve product quality. At Oklahoma State, Dr. Lawman serves as the Animal Science Extension Program Coordinator and Supervisor for the Range Cow Research Center. So we are excited to have him here today presenting on hay feeding efficiency. Now this is a timely topic um, this year. We'll talk, I know he's probably going to talk about some input costs and things like that, um, but just a few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to him. Your microphones will be muted and we're going to ask that they stay that way. If you have any questions, you can do one of two things. If you've joined us online, you can send your questions into the Q&A box at any time. If you've called in, you can text your questions to me. My number is 512-818-5476. So again, if you've called in and you're listening, you can text questions to me anytime at 512-818-5476. In the interest of time, we are going to wait um, to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, Dr. Lawman, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. You should be able to get begin whenever you're ready. Okay, <clears throat> sounds good. Thank you, Ashley. I really do appreciate the opportunity to share some of this information uh, with your group, and I hope hope some of it is uh, beneficial and welcome your comments and questions. Uh, managing uh, winter hay feeding is a, uh, I, I honestly, uh, we, our group kind of got started working in this area a number of years ago because uh, John Deere company at their Atumwa uh, production facility contacted us several years ago and asked if we would be interested in helping them uh, look at a new uh, hay feeding efficiency from a new hay baler that they had manufactured. And so through that through that project, it was really fun to work with John Deere and uh, that led us to, you know, kind of saying, hey, there's uh, there's some low hanging fruit here in terms of being able uh, to save folks some money and maybe improve their overall efficiency and lower their cost of production. I hope you'll see what I mean as we go through this presentation. So Ashley, I'm going to try to get my uh, slide presentation to advance here. I don't know if Teams is like Zoom. Zoom. Sometimes okay. the person hesitates. It hasn't swapped over on our end yet. Um, I don't believe there's anything I can do on that side of it. Nope. There it goes. OK. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's something strange about uh, with the first one. It seems like it really hesitates and it gets going fine after that. So I want to show you this uh, this graph. Uh, this has been Dr. Darrell Peel has been producing this. He and I uh, share this quite a bit in our extension programming. Uh, it's really interesting to me, but if you uh, if you you notice uh, we, you just got year on the X axis of this graph and over on the Y axis is tons of hay produced per cow. Now just a little bit of background on that value. Um, he is he's not included alfalfa hay in this in this calculation. We don't produce a whole lot of alfalfa hay here in Oklahoma, and he's uh, and he's the assumption is that the imports of hay is approximately equal to the exports of hay from our state, you know, across state lines to other states and imported in from other states and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and this is beef cattle, or uh, this is cows 
Uh, and you, you should know that, you know, there's really not much influence of the dairy industry on this number. So this would be primarily grass hay produced, a little bit of other, other types of hay, but boy, not much. Um, the dairy industry, the number of dairy cows in Oklahoma has declined dramatically. So this is primarily hay production for the for the beef cattle industry in the state. And you can see that uh, two things really stand out to me. Number one, it's grown a lot over time. Uh, back in the 1960s, we were feeding less than a ton or producing less than a ton of hay per cow in the 1960s. Today, we produce somewhere around two and a half tons of hay per beef cow in our inventory here in the state of Oklahoma. It'd be interesting to see the trend there in Louisiana over time to see if it's somewhat similar. The other thing that's really interesting to me is the dramatic uh, change uh, in that in that number over the years. You can see what happened here. Anybody remember this year, 2011? Uh, 2012 wasn't a lot better if you're from uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, uh, 2012 was a pretty tough year as well in terms of drought. Uh, also, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that could influence this. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them, but you know, one thing is, guess guess when the round baler was invented? It was invented right about here. Ashley, can you see my cursor moving? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, okay. great. So uh, it was it was invented right here and you can just see the dramatic increase in hay production, at least per cow uh, after that invention. And so maybe we can blame most of this <laughs> on the, you know, the increase in efficiency or um, convenience of producing hay with large round bales uh, compared to all the physical labor it used to take for small square bales and before that small round bales. Very interesting, but uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to say that uh, again, a lot of things could influence this, but uh, you know, one one item might be the fact that we we probably could improve on the efficiency of hay feeding. So uh, improving forage utilization, we're going to talk about several things here. Uh, first of all, reduce hay use and waste by either limit feeding, uh, the choice of the hay feeder that you select. Uh, we're probably not going to talk much about trading bales of liquid feed, but if we have time, we might mention that briefly. And then just a word on ammoniation and combinations of those different things and a couple of studies we've done here that were, we, we found some interesting results on how you can really cut back on the amount of winter hay needed to winter cows. Okay, so uh, the first student uh, the, that worked on a project like this, his name is Austin Sexton. Uh, Austin lives in Kentucky now, but he did uh, two years worth of this hay feeding research. And as part of his project, Austin surveyed producers in the state of Oklahoma to find out some things about how they feed hay and the type of feeders they use. So his first question was, you know, how do you feed your hay? Do you use some sort of a hay ring? Set it in there. Uh, do you use, do you feed hay with no feeder? Uh, surprisingly, quite a few people, 29% selected that option. And very few at that time selected or indicated that they actually roll their hay out. Only 2.4% of folks were rolling hay out like you see in this picture here. 68% said they use some type of a ring uh, type feeder. Now, you know, I suppose it could be that some folks may have been confused and they're at, when they say they're not using a feeder, maybe they're rolling it out and they just and they didn't understand what the term <laughs> rollout meant. So there could be some confusion there. But as you can see, especially in the smaller cow calf operations here in Oklahoma, a lot of folks feed their hay this way and and for that reason, I think maybe this is why, uh, in terms of our views, our SUNUP TV program and so on, uh, hay feeder, the hay feeder efficiency topic that we're talking about here today 
continues to be extremely popular. And I think it's only because most people feed hay, and or at least in eastern half of Oklahoma, uh, and most people have some type of a bale feeder. Uh, so he asked the question, what is the most popular ring style feeder used? And this would be an example of one. I call this the ag shop feeder. Uh, several years ago when I was in high school, I uh, built some feeders like this. Uh, most of the, the young men in my class did the same. Uh, and you can see that uh, it is widely popular uh, because so we, he's got it termed the economy feeder here. It's an open bottom steel ring feeder. That's uh, what he refers to it as. An open bottom just indicates that there's no sheeted bottom here. Um, uh, and then second in his list is open bottom poly ring. So very similar construction, just use a two inch black poly pipe rather than metal. And then a steel ring feeder with sheeted bottom. And I'll show you an example of that here in just a second. And then what factors are important when selecting a bell feeder where you can imagine uh, cost was important uh, to the majority of folks. Weight and ease of handling was really important as well, and that's going to be an issue here in these different style feeders that we're going to review. Quality and durability. I think maybe that might have grown some over time since uh, we conducted this survey several years ago. Uh, seems like more people are concerned about you know these feeders. If you're going to invest the money, making sure you purchase something that's going to last. And also folks seem to have more, uh, let's say tractors with front end loader capacity now than they did several years ago. And therefore the weight of the feeder might not be quite as important as it was a few years ago. Okay, so then uh, this is Austin and the picture over here on the right. Uh, he launched uh, this first experiment where we looked at different hay feeder styles. And I can tell you, I, I'm not sure why, but uh, I keep selecting uh, projects or things to study that require quite a bit of, of labor and th this kind of work is a challenge because you have to measure all that hay waste and you can see in that picture there Austin's writing on a bag where he's sampled the leftover hay or the wasted hay uh, from this experiment every morning the way the way we go we go about this is well yeah on the left you can see us weighing uh, the round bale before it's placed in the pen with the cattle. Uh, we sample that bale uh, to determine what the nutritive value of that hay is. Then they go out every 24 hours, 24 hours after that bale is put in the pen. Uh, they go out, we, we feed the hay on the concrete slab like Austin standing on there on the right uh, so that we can go rake it up and not, uh, you know, sort of get it uh, confused the waste from the hay bale confused with any grass particles, dirt, soil, and so on in a dirt floor pen. So we used concrete to try to make sure that we were clearly measuring hay waste and not other material. Uh, but you can see they gathered up the waste in these trash cans and those had to be weighed every day on electronic scale. This is the first feeder he used. I'm, this is just kind of an older, uh, what I call the ag shop feeder. He calls it open bottom steel ring. Open because there's no sheet there. At the time, this would have been about six years ago. Uh, Austin uh, thought you could purchase or have these built for around $100. They only weigh about 100 pounds, so they're not too difficult you know, to lift up, stand up on the edge and just roll over to your next location for hay feeding. Obviously they have an open bottom. These don't have very many uh, vertical uh, bars and so there's six feeding stations in this particular hay feeder. This is the two inch poly pipe feeder that Austin studied. Uh, they're made here r relatively close by. These are really popular because they're light uh, and they're fairly uh, uh, solid in terms of construction and last a good long time. Uh, so they're they're just really, really popular. You see them just lined up at all the Atwoods and so on. Uh, they continue to be very popular hay feeder. They're very light. They're inexpensive. Uh, they also have an open bottom, also six feeding stations in this particular hay feeder. You can count them 
uh, just looking around the edge of that feeder with the vertical bars. Okay, this is the uh, sheeted bottom uh, steel ring feeder that we use for this particular experiment. These are, uh, as I recall, these are manufactured in Iowa. Uh, it, it was a little bit more expensive. I'm sure they, if we go back and check today, they'd be a, uh, considerably more expensive than $300. Uh, but they weighed about twice what the other two feeders uh, did. So these would be a little more difficult uh, just to tip over on the edge and roll roll around in the field. You're probably going to get along better uh, with some type of a front end loader to move these to a new location. Uh, the big advantage is probably the metal apron around the bottom or that sheeted bottom to uh, keep cattle from crawling in there or reaching in there with a the foot and keep that hay from uh, leaking out at the bottom of the feeder. This one's got 15 uh, feeding stations and slanted bars. Okay, and then this is the newer style feeder that we were introduced to by actually John Deere, the engineers there at John Deere. This is uh, the Bextra, B-E-X-T-R-A model, and I'm gonna show uh, the results from this feeder, uh, quite a few pictures, well, from all these models actually, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we don't have any, any reason to push one model or style feeder over the other, but the unique uh, thing about this particular feeder is that the, it has two features. One is the modified cone at the top there. You can see it's got the, the more restricted ring in the middle to hold the bell towards the middle of the feeder, and then it's got the slanted basket towards the top of the feeder, and you can see how narrow those bars are at the top. So that sort of restricts cow's ability to pull the hay out of the top of the feeder. It encourages them to reach down through, sort of like a feed bunk, reach down in and up uh, to, uh, to pull, pull that hay out of the feeder and therefore drops the hay uh, back down in the feeder if they decide to back out. 525, they're considerably more expensive again today uh, than that, they weigh 300 pounds. Again, not going to be terribly convenient. I have that solid metal apron, just like uh, the sheeted ring feeder I showed you previously. This one's got nine feeding stations. Here's the results from that study. Uh, here, here I've got modified cone feeder. This is the Bextra open bottom steel ring. The black poly feeder ring just means the yellow ring feeder, okay, that's got the slanted bars and the sheeted bottom. There's total waste in pounds. Uh, probably the easiest thing to follow and understand is this waste row of data expressed as percent of bale weight. So the two open feeders, basically the cattle wasted on average about 21% of the original bale weight, okay? Uh, the uh, ring feeder was considerably better and was statistically different at 13% of the original bale weight, and that modified cone feeder performed very well with only uh, a little over 5% uh, waste uh, expressed as percent of the original bale weight. So let me just show you some pictures uh, as we went along in Austin Austin grabbed these. Here you see right after you can see that we've got the we've got the uh, concrete slab cleaned off. Uh, he's just pulled the strings off of this bale and dropped it in the feeder, and away we go. Okay, you see down here at the bottom. This is the extra feeder. You see H equal 24. That indicates that this is 24 hours. This picture was taken 24 hours after that bale was introduced into this feeder. You do see a little bit of waste out here, but not a whole lot. This is 48 hours later, <clears throat> 24 hours later. So uh, 48 hours after that bale was introduced into the pen. Still not a lot of hay waste, but there is some. Hour 72, bale is starting to collapse now and fall down kind of below that restricted ring in the middle. Uh, so it's getting down here and starting to spread out in the feeder. And it's interesting that once that bale gets pretty low and, and smaller in there, the actual waste in these particular bale feeders actually starts to go up slightly. 
Okay, so here's the open bottom steel ring. This is our zero, same lot of, of hay, exact same uh, hay harvest uh, meadow or lot or whatever. Uh, the, these are big old bales. They weighed close to 1,400 pounds. And you can see that's about all uh, that open bottom steel ring feeder could handle. There's our zero. You can see he's got his pad cleaned off and away we go. This is uh, our 24 considerable those cows have been able to pull considerable hay off that not i didn't mention it but i think in each one of these pastures or pens uh, there would have been 14 cows and so that's the stocking rate if you're interested in that this is our 48 now remember we cleaned this up as soon as he took the picture everything outside of this feeder was raked up put in those trash cans and weighed on electronic scale and this is the manure would have been scraped off and pitched out here uh, this this would have been completely clean this is 24 hours later so this is all new waste that the cows have pulled out onto the concrete pad here's our 72 you've still got a considerable amount of hay waste going on um, at that point in time, and this is our 96. So we've got pretty similar waste each time we'd go back uh, to weigh these before the hay was completely consumed. All right, this is the uh, open bottom poly feeder. You see the clean concrete pad. 24 hours later, no surprise, you know, it's going to, you think it would perform similarly to the uh, open bottom steel ring, and indeed they do, as I showed you uh, just a minute ago. This is 48 hours. It's, it must be a windy day, right? Wind's blowing out of the south. This is north up here. You can see all the hay waste is shoved up against this concrete feed bunk, uh, but considerable amount of waste. There's 72 hours, no wind on this day. Uh, but a lot of hay waste out here on that particular day in this feeder. And this is our 96. Okay. Here's the, uh, uh, the yellow uh, sheeted ring feeder. Um, there are some waste on our 24, similar amount, our 48, 72. Again, each one of these periods, right after we take the picture, we're cleaning all this up and cleaning the manure, trying to separate the manure and pitching it off the pad so that that concrete pad's completely clean every day. The only thing that's left is the hay inside the perimeter of the feeder. Okay, I wanted to mention this one. I don't have any data on this particular feeder style, uh, but this is the same yellow ring. Franklin Industries produces the, the yellow ring, as I recall. And this is their, in, their cone insert. So you just drop this cone inside that yellow feeder. And so it's a two piece uh, combination. And I'll just tell you uh, this feeder, as you can see here, that feeder's probably been in there, eh, I don't know, may, maybe 24 hours. I don't remember exactly, but you can see there's not much waste out here. This, uh, there are several companies that produce a combination like this, and these are very efficient. Now, they're, they're heavy. Uh, you know, you've, now you've got two big chunks of metal to deal with, uh, so they're not terribly convenient. And there's no way, or, I, I can't imagine anybody having a, you know, a bale feeder on the back of their, you know, flatbed pickup where you'd be able to drop a bale in here. This is gonna require a front end loader to put a bale of hay in here. So, you know, those are drawbacks, but I'll tell you this, uh, this setup was very similar to the Baxter feeder at around five to 6% in the experiments that we, we have conducted up to this point. Okay, here's another nice study from the University of Missouri looking at hay feeder styles. Uh, they looked at a very similar open uh, feeder. Uh, they've got more feeding stations in this one. This is a little nicer model than the one we used. You can see there's more vertical bars down here. They're slanted in quite a few individual feeding stations around that feeder. This is a tapered. They just call it a tapered feeder. I can't tell you what the manufacturer's name is at this point, but you know, it's kind of got that restricted ring here, similar to the Bextra feeder. It's smaller and so uh, these bars slant to the interior of the feeder. They just don't have the basket on top of that ring. 
Here's a Kung feeder. This is a per fairly popular uh, feeder brand here in Oklahoma, at least. Uh, and I'm sorry, I should have looked it up. Ashley, we could probably Google it right quick and see uh, what the name of this one is. Uh, but it's got this chain basket mechanism as well as a solid sheeted bottom here. OK, it's got the vertical bar feeding stations and quite a few feeding stations around that feeder, the basket. And then similar to the Bexter feeder, it restricts the animals access to the hay up high because in, in this case it's got a solid sheeted uh, uh, piece up here at the top so that the cows can't pull hay out and just drop it right here on the pen surface or the pasture surface. Here's the results from uh, the uh, Missouri uh, data. Here they're feeding alfalfa haylage and you'll notice there just isn't a whole lot of waste here six and a half, four point nine seven percent in those three feeder types. So very little hay waste with the alfalfa haylage. I suppose because that material is wet, it's heavier, maybe a little bit more difficult to pull out. The wind doesn't blow it around and so on. And so they just didn't have much waste and there's definitely no difference in those numbers from a statistical standpoint. But when they put dry fescue hay in there, they did see some differences. This is uh, their fescue hay. Uh, you see about 9% waste in the cone, 13.6% in that tapered feeder, and 19% in that open bottom feeder. Uh, so very similar to the results we get, 20 to 21% I showed you. Uh, they get 19% with that particular feeder. Uh, some advantage to that tapered feeder with a sheeted bottom, and then substantial improvement uh, with that cone feeder with the sheeted top and sheeted bottom. OK, so just a quick quick comment about reducing hay, hay uh, intake and two ways to do that. This actually turns out to be an advantage in terms of hay waste because you can imagine anytime you limit cows access to hay, they're going to clean it up, right? And that will reduce uh, waste and certainly it does. But you know, there's there's some give and take there because sometimes you know to gain uh, an improvement, you have to give up some things. In this case, it's probably labor, and in particular, if you're gonna if you're gonna roll hay out or if you're gonna limit cows' access to bales in in rings or feeders, you know you're gonna have to be there every day uh, to to roll hay out. If assuming the cattle don't have access to standing forage. You know, it really needs to be, you need to limit the amount and feed it every day. If you if you go out and roll out enough hay for two or three days worth, you're going to have a lot of waste because they'll fill up and then they'll lay in it, defecate on it, urinate on it, and so on. Uh, and you can't just go feed hay, you know, twice a week. Uh, and unless, you know, unless you limit the amount they get and they have standing forage to keep them uh, full in between uh, those feeding intervals. So that's something to, to consider there. Uh, if you roll hay out every day, uh, I think there's very little data on that, but what little there is indicates that, you know, if you restrict their access, uh, it's very efficient. You, you have very little waste. The more days worth you tried to feed at a time, <clears throat> the more waste you have. So it could easily get up there to 20 or 30 percent of the original bell weight uh, if you feed more than one day at a time. OK, other technologies. Just a quick comment about some other things we've done that's pretty interesting. I think uh, we, we limited cows access uh, and then we ammoniated some bales. And so let me show you. Let me show you that. So here's a, this is actually a study at University of Minnesota. Uh, published in 2011. Uh, these uh, these uh, authors uh, gave cows 24-7 access to hay over here in the 24-hour column, only 14 hours access or six hours. So basically what they're doing is they're putting the round bales in a pen, opening the gate, letting the cows in to, to feed, and so if they let them in it, you know, uh, 6 a.m. here they'd pull them out at noon and shut the gate. 
until tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Or do that, let them have access in that pen for 14 hours. And you can see here that it did, the more they limited access to the hay, the more the feed intake was restricted, and you would expect that. Uh, cow body weight change was was uh, not significantly different, but it looks like there's a you know a numeric trend here uh, for cows to gain less weight the more they were restricted, and you'd expect that too, especially if their if their feed intake goes down. But the other thing that I'm not showing here is that the more you restrict the hay intake, the increase, the better the forage digestibility gets. Because if you uh, restrict intake, the forage stays in the rumen longer, and those the microbial population in the rumen has more time to digest more of that feed or digest it more thoroughly. And so, you know, that's something you might want to consider. Um, if and we, we don't recommend this strategy with low quality hay because you don't want to be restricting access and have low quality hay at the same time. That's kind of a uh, double whammy if you're a, if you're a cow. We uh, nice quality grass hay or alfalfa grass mix or something like that. This strategy works really well. Uh, you probably don't want to expose first calf heifers to this kind of a limitation or older cows with marginal teeth. Uh, but those cows that are middle-aged, nice quality hay, you can really save a lot of your hay crop if you have, you know, the facilities or a setup that would make this make this convenient. We had a lot of people using this strategy in 2011 and 2012 when hay was incredibly expensive, and it saved a lot of folks a lot of money. It's more work, uh, but it but it can it can it can definitely uh, work. Here's a little project where we actually combine some things. We uh, uh, standard technology. Uh, we, we simply let these cows have 24 seven access to the hay. We use the yellow ring as kind of the middle of the road hay feeder and we didn't use any any feed additive. Then the technology group, we limited these cows to seven hours of access. So open the gate, let them in. Seven hours later, we push the cows out and shut the gate. Then we use the better quality hay feeder or, or better hay saving, uh, lower hay waste feeder, in, in this case, the Bextra feeder. And then we supplemented these cows with 200 milligrams in their feed supplement per day. These cows got the same supplement, they just didn't have a remincin in their supplement. Okay, here's a picture of the 24 seven group. Now this is low quality hay. It was harvested in the drought, and so the stem length was really short. Uh, and boy, they wasted a lot of hay. It was really dry, very short stem length, and that and that equates to hay that a bale that just falls apart when the cows start pulling on it in that feeder. And you can see the extreme waste. Same hay. Uh, this is just across the way in the other pen. There you see what happened with the Bextra bale feeder. Uh, seven hours of access and, and of course the rumensin didn't have anything to do with hay waste here. Uh, the cows did perform slightly better with the rumensin supplement, but uh, pretty, pretty uh, impressive. And this, you know, this occurred throughout the experiment. We had uh, several replications of this and it, and it was very consistent. So worked really well. Here's the data on that study, standard versus technology. Uh, see, here's the hay waste in the standard. It was 25% of original bale weight. I can't imagine going to all the expense of, you know, fertilizing your field, harvesting the hay, hauling it to a storage period, then taking it back out to the pasture or pen and feeding it. And at that point, wasting 25% of your crop. Now, granted, you know, some people will argue and it's and you know, it's a good argument that, you know, all of that hay that's wasted is not just waste. It is returning some nutrients to the soil, but maybe not so much. If it's all piling up in the same area. Uh, technology only 12% waste on that really low quality hay that that just exploded when you put it in the hay feeder. So 18% savings in that case. 
here's a study where we combined some technologies and used ammoniation of these bales. And this is a picture of the stack of hay that was ammoniated. Um, kind of the way we went about doing that. Uh, this is labor intensive, but boy, uh, the folks in Missouri are really good at this and they, they harvest uh, aftermath after they've uh, taken the fescue seed off of their fescue fields, they'll harvest that hay and ammoniate it and it makes really nice quality hay. So in this study, we use 24 hour access, pretty much the same uh, uh, kind of control here. Uh, to the yellow ring hay feeder, no feed additive. And this time we use only six hours of access of the ammoniated hay instead of the untreated hay that we used up here. We use the same modified cone, same 200 milligrams of remincent. Uh, here's the results from that study. Uh, tw again, standard 22%. Last study it was 25%. And then we got the hay waste and that low quality hay uh, exploded when you opened it, when you pulled the net wrap off, we got it down to 7% with the, all that technology and really saved a lot of hay wintering cows if you could go to that much extra effort and, and a little more expense. Okay, uh, a couple more things. Uh, this is just, uh, I, I thought this was kind of comical and true. Uh, Ag talk blog I ran across here one day. It says, hay rings cost a lot anymore with the price of steel gone up. <laughs> For sure they do. Uh, we've always unrolled, makes ground more fertile by spreading manure to areas where you feed. Boy, that makes a lot of sense and that's a really good strategy. Just unroll what you think they will clean up and take the rest back to the shed. Hay rings make a mess with manure all at one spot. A lot of truth to that statement and I'd, I'd say wholeheartedly, if that's a, a management strategy that fits you, uh, that you definitely ought to consider. We've seen a lot of uh, old videos and, and presentations where folks will maybe rent an abused pasture and then just purchase hay and roll hay out all over that pasture and really over a period of two or three, four years, rejuvenate that soil. Uh, because of you know the manure spreading out in that in that pasture and the other uh, organic material that goes back into the soil. Okay, this is uh, an, a strategy I learned years ago from the Forge Systems Research Center at the University of Missouri. It's really interesting, and they've been using this strategy there for years. I couldn't tell you if they do today or not, but what they do is they harvest the hay and then immediately take it right back out there on the meadow, uh, assume the last harvest of the year, and then they space it in, in intervals. So here they've got it spaced at about 20 foot intervals. Uh, and however much hay you want to put out, but that spreads it out over a region of that hay meadow and then when it comes time to hay feed, feed the hay, they just put an electric fence around this portion or around the bales and leave, in this case, three rows out. If they want to put three rings out at a time, they drop the rings on there, let the cows clean this up. Uh, then they come, come out eventually when they need to feed more hay and they'll move the electric fence back to here. You move the hay feeders, back there obviously onto these bales and off you go and at the end of the year of course you're going to have probably some cleanup to do uh, you maybe need to rake uh, this area uh, make sure you got all the you know net wrap or string uh, cleaned up maybe even overseed uh, whatever forage uh, species you, you choose uh, to try to encourage that to, back to you know productivity because you're probably going to damage some of the sod uh, but then what they would do every year is they would move the location so next year they'd probably feed down here in this corner or over in this corner of that hay meadow so pretty neat strategy that should work for some folks Ashley okay I think I'm about to wrap it up here uh, here's my uh, quick summary sheeted bottom or ring is worth about eight percent of your hay crop. You might keep that in mind. That's what we found consistently over time. Some type of a cone or basket mechanism is worth another 8% of your hay crop. And so we've used, as I showed you, uh, the uh, chain cone style, the Bextra 
sort of that modified cone style, uh, the Franklin that's got the insert uh, cone, those all work extremely well and are very effective. They're worth about another 8% of your hay crop. Limiting access to hay, whether you roll it out or whether you uh, let the cows in a pen and kick them out six, seven, eight hours later, that can reduce the, your hay needs by 15 to 25%. Again, we don't recommend that strategy for lower quality grass hay uh, or for extremely young cows or your old cows. Combining hay feeder type, limited access and ammoniation, all those uh, can can get you up to 30% plus hay savings. And then finally rolling out must be managed to achieve those savings. You about have to feed it daily if you don't have standing forage and pay close attention to that amount fed. All right, Ashley, that's all I've got. I'd, well, I'd be uh, happy to have a conversation or take or take, 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 any, take questions. any questions. Thank you. So um, just a reminder for those of you listening in, you have a couple of ways that you can send questions in. Um, you should have access to the Q&A box if you're uh, watching this online. And then if you've called in, you can text questions to me um, at 512-818-5476. Um, so Dr. Lawman, I was looking up those the basket hay feeders from the Missouri study you referenced. And yeah. for some reason, um, Google wouldn't let me pull up that um, let me go ahead and share the screen really quick, but it would not let me pull up the um, actual PDF. But so I saw um, hay hopper and hay manger as some okay. vertical bars, and then um, I always pronounce it incorrectly, but is it Bell and Country? And then Woodward Crossing had similar with the basket, the chain basket, okay. um, just planted as opposed to to vertical bars there on those. Um, do you? Yeah, that sounds familiar. I'm sorry. I just said that that sounds familiar, the, uh, those brands. If you would like to go ahead and um, make a plug, I can scroll down on my screen here. If you would like to talk about y'all's webinar series and um, your SunUp YouTube channel as well, um, as we wait to see if any questions come in. Okay, I'll do that. Ashley, would you do me a favor? I just thought of something else. Uh, would you Google hay waste calculator at the Noble Foundation and let's pull that up and show that to your group. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I'll go ahead and oh you want okay. Yeah, we can do it on here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> real easy. To, it's pops right up. Usually it's easy to find. I cut myself off, but there it is. So if you're interested, the Noble uh, Research Institute has produced this real nice online calculator and you can put your own numbers in here. Uh, for the weight of the bales, number of bales fed per month, number of months hay is fed normally in your operation, and you can select the ring feeder type, and it's got those same feeders that we used in our experiment. Can you just scroll down there a little bit, Ashley? Uh, and it's a really handy little uh, little calculator, and and I think you'll be surprised. <laughs> at the, uh, well, I don't know, that, that you can justify a little more expensive feeder based on hay waste. Now, everybody has to weigh, you know, the cost against convenience, I understand that. But I uh, just wanted to make you aware of that calculator. It's real simple to use and handy tool. Okay, so Ashley, uh, and I were, were visiting about these webinars and we do have one coming up and I appreciate her uh, being willing to share ours coming up this Thursday. Uh, can you scroll down there, Ashley, and maybe click on that? Yeah, pull up the flyer, please. There we go. So if you want to register, you can go here to beef.okstate.edu. Huh. My computer's uh, difficult, sorry. Give it a second. Oh. Okay, all right. Um, beef.okstate.edu that's the website she's on there now um, and you can just register for that they're free uh, but we're the first session uh, so we're, we're dealing with drought here in Oklahoma 
Uh, it looks like it's going to continue for a while. We've had folks have to pull cattle off of wheat pasture. Uh, so we're going to talk about this first round on Thursday, whether you can afford to feed cattle to get to green grass. You just say you're growing calves. Uh, and then also I'm going to talk about, you know, trying to uh, maintain those replacement heifers or get them to your target endpoint uh, between now. We've got about 60 days until our grass greens up here in Oklahoma. Uh, and then from there on, we're going to talk about native range management and drought and then introduce uh, pastures and high cost of fertilizer on February uh, 17th. And then on February 24th, uh, we've got a Mesonet weather stations here in Oklahoma and our expert is Mr. Wesley and he's going to talk about what we can expect in terms of the weather. Uh, so we gave him the tough job, but then Dr. Daryl Peel is going to talk about whether folks ought to consider destocking their pastures based on the drought. And that's all on February 24th. Welcome to join us. Thank you, and I'll get that link um, as well as the Noble Hay Ring Waste calculator uh, when I get this video posted. Um, so if, if you're new to our Beef Brunch series, I will have this posted on our YouTube channel and we'll get that shared with everyone and I'll have um, this lunchtime series, a link to it posted as well as um, that hay, hay Ring Waste calculator. Excellent. Um, I do not see any questions that have come in, um, so I want to thank you again for your time today for presenting this and um, I'll, I'll let everyone know if they have any questions. Do you mind if they email them to me and I, I forward them over to you or how would you like to handle no, that if any be, questions come in? Yeah, that would be fine, Ashley. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you again, Dr. Lawman, and we hope that you all have a great day.